Hello, and welcome to Reinventing Nerds. Today, we have a special guest, Pat Cullen. Pat is the VP of Engineering at Carrot. Now, what is Carrot, you may wonder? Carrot is short for Carrot Fertility, and it is the leading global fertility healthcare and family-forming benefits provider for employers and health plans. Well, what does Pat do? Pat oversees and directs Carrot's information technology, information security, data, and engineering teams. He has more than a decade of experience as a technologist and thought leader who builds effective teams by driving engineering best practices, empowering developer productivity, and promoting deliverable alignment. We've got a lot to learn from Pat. So Pat, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. Oh, uh, it's a pleasure. I'm so glad that you're a guest on the show today. I, I want to start out uh, with your background because you have a wide range of experience. I mean, you've worked both for high growth startups as well as Fortune 500 companies. You have a range of industries. And I also noticed that in addition to your computer science training background, you have an MBA. So I'd like to start there. Uh, can you give us your story on studying computer science business and working in engineering all the way up to Carrot. Yeah, yeah, the MBA. That was an interesting one. I had I had this planned like from the start uh, and, and I stuck to it. I don't think that's very common. So I was like a junior in high school. Wow. And uh, I was a, a team captain of like everything I did. We're like the band leader for percussion or the team captain for the cross country team. And so I always felt that, you know, the impact of a collective could be greater than that of an individual. And my thought was, uh, I want to see if I can combine my computer science side of things that I want to continue to study and, and passionate and driven by with an MBA to enable further opportunities for leadership. Um, and uh, that's what led me to the MBA. Uh, How has that influenced you? I mean, I'm not a lot of engineering computer science people have an MBA. So has that influenced yeah. any of your leadership decision making or career path? It's, it's it's been such a multiplier or like intangible even I would say and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, approaches of things that got exposed during my MBA that I was surprised by um, from just like understanding how like the people ops slash HR side of things works and being mm -hmm. a more effective partner. Uh, understanding how a balance sheet works, like accounts receivable, accounts payable, um, to be uh, an effective accounting team partner. And so like in the Venn diagram of how I can operate with all the different cross-functional departments that I need to support and they need to support me, I feel like I've leaned in a little bit more on each one and have a little bit more context so that I can understand what's motivating them and how that can be a complement to the uh, goals that I'm working on. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, that's, I think, the hardest part. I mean, because so often people are really trained in their expertise in, mm -hmm. in computer science and engineering or, or other technical fields. And you get so laser focused on being the best at that and don't have as much of an understanding or appreciation for the other fields or other departments in the organization. So that really yeah. gives you a leg up. Yeah. And I wasn't sure at first, like uh, earlier in my career, when I was uh, uh, titled as a software engineer, it didn't necessarily expose itself as much. There were definitely some just leadership conversations that like, like approaches to collaborating and, and group projects that were emphasized in my MBA that were helpful kind of at a, a meta level. But some of those things I was describing at having a little bit more context on your cross-functional counterparts mm -hmm. um, outside of product development, um, that that started to be exposed as I got into management roles. And then I could be, mm -hmm. you know, may, maybe I started working more with uh, the accounting team on controls in compliance principles for SOC 2 compliance. And mm -hmm. I could understand where they were coming from and like what they needed so that we could you know, defend developer productivity while ensuring that we're meeting the obligations to ensure a, a safe and secure environment. Wow. So I, I was actually going to ask you about that. When did it really start emerging? But let's mm -hmm. let's go back to your engineering career here. So we've talked a little bit about your training and background. So what did you do? How, how did you get to where you are now? Oh, yeah, that was an interesting road. I, <laughs> my MBA year was uh, 08, 09, and that was a tough year to get a, to leave college. Yes. That, that was, that was recession time. So mm -hmm. um, I ended up um, 
starting my career, uh, oh, I will never forget, I had an engineering interview where they asked me about the difference in SQL between an inner join and an outer join. <laughs> join and I froze. And it was, it, there was some co other complex questions. Mm -hmm. Interviewing was so much different back then than it is now. And uh, it's evolved in a good way. But long story short, I ended up, uh, I worked in a help desk role for um, IT help desk for about mm -hmm. a year, year and a half. And um, during that, my, my help desk activities started to be like mentoring people in jQuery and running, uh, running uh, sun certified web developer courses for our engineers. So it was uh, like above and beyond necessarily like ensuring, you know, account access and productive uh, workstations. Um, so that, that led me to uh, getting some opportunities with the company I was working with to uh, develop uh, and contribute to uh, some of their consulting projects because it was a consulting firm. Um, and then eventually uh, that, that company actually, uh, and I have empathy for the environment we have today, had to lead to layoffs actually. So mm -hmm. I was let go from there. Um, and then uh, immediately, uh, so lucky, luckily and immediately got an opportunity with GE. Uh, and then I got to help, I get to get my hands, you know, full-time into code and more of an engineer role um, with it, with a twist of in, ensuring like more of a business analyst and exploring the requirements. So it was a nice blend, uh, kind of like a product engineer in a sense. Um, and got to help GE help their, their uh, partner power companies with ensuring that things like blackouts and brownouts don't occur um, and, and working mm -hmm. with like phaser data. So that was a really, really interesting job. Um, yeah, and, so important too. Yeah. I mean, here we're in San Diego, blackouts, brownouts, power grid. It's so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It, that's a complex environment. Uh, I did my best to, uh, keep up with the, um, tech, the, the, I guess the non-code side of that, like how it actually flows, but huh. you know, there's whole, whole degrees dedicated to how, how power systems work that, uh, I, mm -hmm. I definitely have some imposter syndrome there still. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I mean, I can keep keep well, going. If yeah, you prefer, go or... on. Like, so that was a sure. big company. You said you, you've also yep. had other experience at, at startups. I'd love to get to, you know, how you yeah. felt comfortable in both environments here. Um, and totally. maybe sort of the risk factor too, right? And starting in smaller versus larger companies. So technically, I was never at that time a direct employee of GE. Mm -hmm. um, and I was an employee through another uh, consulting firm. And that firm... Uh, the owner of it, uh, he had a strong experience in the AAU basketball like area and had had, mm -hmm. had helped guide some organizations in the upstate New York area and wanted to see if we could fill a niche in creating a more supportive social network, tournament generation, tournament management type of software solution for basketball clubs and organizations within the AAU space. So when I was considering at that point, there was a um, there was a fork in my possible path where uh, GE was uh, very happy and looking to consider bringing me on full time. But then at the same time, uh, my my current boss was like, "Hey, um, I think we we've got the capacity that we can self fund this opportunity to basically have you drive this as a startup, like incubated within our consulting firm." And wow. um, so that's I was like, "Yeah, hands down." I, you know, that sounds like such a like an empowering opportunity. And I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> I, I went to a couple talks and every, every like tech talks, tech stack, I would just pick pieces from what people recommended, uh, not necessarily knowing how to apply them. It actually worked together pretty well. Um, and uh, it was, I learned so much. Uh, and uh, that, that was a blast from, from doing, from having nothing uh, to, you know, building a proof of concept having several customers, expanding the team. Um, um, and then, I mean, eventually we, we folded and uh, it, it didn't, we didn't make our way out of, you know, like some of those, that, that early inflection curve of mm -hmm. the adoption curve of a startup. But it really taught me how to, um, like, how to come to every situation with, you know, two to three possible 
decisions or outcomes as, as opposed to needing to ask somebody for everything because there wasn't like anyone for me to ask besides the owner who was also running a consulting company at the time. Wow. I mean, that's, that's great. And you, you talk about it with a smile, not like, oh, it was a big failure, but it was a great opportunity for you uh, to grow as a person too. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. It was my first opportunity at uh, mentoring other engineers and they are uh, directors and managers themselves now uh, that, that, that were my interns at the time. Uh, being strong leaders in other organizations across the U.S. Well, I'd like to ask you about Carrot because you started there. Like, what employee number were you? I mean, were you like one of the founding yeah. members of, of Carrot Fertility or what? Not quite. Okay. Not quite. Just after. So I was, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to math exactly, but uh, I like, I think nine sounds better than 10. So I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> okay. So I was, a, I was approximately employee number nine at Carrot. Mm -hmm. So they had gone through a, a batch of y, a y Combinator um, and there were a couple of co-founders there. They had brought in on one or two employees, had brought on their first two full-time engineers, one of them being a co-founder. Um, and then they were looking for someone to help organize and shape based on having some of that experience of, 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 of how to uh, like enable a small group of engineers to swarm on tackling the next set of opportunities. Um, so I, yeah, I, I came in pretty early um, and uh, I, I didn't know, like I was considering the, the Bay Area to look for what I would call a more employee driven environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I was moving across the country and uh, I, I was so lucky that uh, Tammy, our CEO, was working with this advisor at the time and he actually reached out to me. So I didn't know what care it was at the time. And I was like, sure, I was planning to literally fly back to Albany tonight, but if you want to book me a hotel, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stay for another day. Um, and, you know, um, the rest is history, um, as they say, where I met the team and uh, was blown away at one, the opportunity to contribute to such an altruistic mission. But mm -hmm. then I think that's very important to me. But what is also very important and potentially a tad more important to me was that it was a very supportive team that I could tell I could help build the, you know, an effective culture from the ground up. Uh, and there's just certain things when you join these 10,000 person companies that it, it's like changing the direction of a sailboat versus a cruise ship. Um, right. And, and I wanted to start with the sailboat. Mm -hmm. So what, what was your position when you first started? Yeah, it was head of engineering, okay. uh, which was all three of us. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. now you're a VP and you have yeah. all sorts of responsibilities. Sure. Yeah. So all those responsibilities existed. It was just a very much smaller, okay. you know, amount of, okay. of, uh, of activities per type of responsibility, just like mm -hmm. any company, right? The responsibilities grow and grow and grow, and then right. you branch off to mm -hmm. specializations along the way. So yeah. Yeah. As we grew, uh, I kept, uh, there's, there's been things that we've, identified along the way of like, okay, now this is specialized enough that we're at the point that this probably shouldn't be under engineering anymore, mm -hmm. such as like business intelligence okay. started with me. And then we've branched that off into its mm -hmm. own respective department. Okay. Uh, and then there's other things I've kept such as information security and data privacy, mm -hmm. as we've found great synergies on keeping that dimension within, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, my team and, and, and our engineering purview. Well, I want to ask you about this experience because it's, it's so exciting to to hear how you, I mean, how you have adapted and uh, as the company has grown and what your leadership responsibilities have been. And, and I want to dive into that a little bit more because, you know, when you're in a small company, you said it was all three of you at the time, right? At the very beginning, right? And this is like very common in, in startup environments is that it's so casual. Everybody knows each other. You all know what's going on. There's really no need for structure, the documentation so much, right? And then, right, then the company starts growing and, and there are more people and you don't know as many, you don't know what's going on. People get uncomfortable and communication, uh, miscommunication can come up, conflicts. I mean, how have you handled that at Carrot or maybe even just not you, but the entire organization? How have you handled that? There's a couple dimensions here. Um, there's 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 the fact that uh, I think a little bit unique to some of the early like technical co-founders that lead to CTO roles is the fact that like I had the experience of managing. I had at, uh, my previous company before Carrot. I had five engineering teams, about thirty five engineers. So I had an, a concept, and I had seen that grow from a mm -hmm. smaller group where I I didn't 
I didn't manage that company's entire department of engineering, but I was there at the company when the entire department was approximately that size. So I, I had a good amount of exposure at those phases. So unlike some other, I think there's a lot of technical co-founders that tend to move into more of like a technical architect role. I was in it for like very excited to contribute technically, but very excited to continue to see how I could evolve it to the most effective organization as possible. Mm -hmm. So more of the VP of engineering as opposed to the CTO potentially, even though those are both very soft role definitions. Everybody, there's there's articles and articles written about mm -hmm. the, the how, how 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 they it just matters what your company describes either one of those as, and it's not necessarily a formal definition. So that part was helpful. Um, but then there's things there are I would say areas that I I needed to learn to let go and um, understand that some of my experiences and uh, for lack of better terms, distaste for certain types of processes. Mm -hmm. um, like I needed to really reflect on uh, what I uh, what I think is like one of, a very important line from the Agile Manifesto, which is it's people over process. So those processes, while important and are the effective way to help you you drive collaboratively, um, you can make uh, almost any process work if you've got the right people on board. Um, and one example that comes to mind is uh, me having a lot of resistance as we grew with providing my CEO, Tammy, with um, just roadmaps, just roadmaps of the product direction. I'm like, no, 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 we're agile and we need to be able to pivot. And I don't want to lock in that this thing's going to happen in this time. And she's like, Pat, listen, I promise that whatever, like, you know, it's kind of like, Pat, who hurt you? Like, <laughs> I promise, I promise that whatever experiences you've had, I will work with you and I will not hold you to a march. Like, uh, I think, you know, some companies might call it like a death march towards a feature right. delivery. Um, and, and since then we've used that tool as a very effective way to collaborate in shorthand, uh, alignment for people that don't necessarily need that whole picture, but they have to understand when things will approximately unfold across many different departments at Carrot. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I heard two things that really came out of, of what you just said, that one is letting go of certain things and also, um, I guess becoming more comfortable with things that you don't necessarily enjoy or didn't enjoy like the process and the road mapping and, and doing that and learning uh, the benefits of that. And also it sounds like you're also willing to have the discussion with your leadership on the pros and cons and how to manage through it so that there was some flexibility there. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's wow. this other dimension too. Okay. Um, that took me a little bit, a little while to learn. And that is other departments don't and shouldn't operate the same way that engineering necessarily operates. Oh, that's a, a nice <laughs> little uh, lesson learned there. And uh, any, w why would you say that? In our current model that we have at Carrot, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we want to achieve our mission of fertility care for all, we need to be successful at selling that product. So if we take a look at like the, our sales organization, they have different drivers and a different operating model. There's a commission model. There's like, there's stresses of responding quickly in cycle times. Uh, commonly you'll see, like I said, like time sensitive commission driven model to incentivize optimal business outcomes. So if you push too hard on gaining context where we're challenging the whys, um, in the model that we expect with like slightly longer timelines within engineering, you're placing a lot of stress on that team. And instead you need to, you need to think about that and think about how, like, it's not a one size fits all on process. And, um, you need to adjust those operating modes to consider like maybe other tools to give you an opportunity to gain context that allows them to continue to act quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's like sales recording tools that will uh, allow your account execs or whoever may be driving these conversations with you to record those calls. And then you can look at them later to gain some of the context and the tone from the people that they were working with to get a deal, deal across the finish line that you're trying to slightly mold to make sure it's the best product for Carrot. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. And it, it also sounds that's also a little bit of letting go of control, like letting others do things their way and you doing what works for your teams and everybody respecting each other for those differences. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, mm -hmm. ensuring that you uh, always seek first to understand and drive with em empathy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm just wondering, I mean, you've been there for how long now at Carrot? Yeah, it's uh, just a little over four years. Four years. Okay. What, what do you think that maybe have been any kind of major milestones or things that 
have helped you develop as a leader for yourself or any challenges that, that you've had to adapt to, um, aside from just the growth of the company, but things that you've learned as a leader that you might want to pass on to others. Yeah. I will. I mean, those, those are some good ones that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, seek first to understand, drive with empathy. Um, other departments shouldn't necessarily operate the same way that mm -hmm. you do within your engineering ecosystem. And, um, there is just a lot of processes and, 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 and standards for how your, as you become a leader, that's more cross-functional and your teammates become non-engineers, uh, uh, you know, stepping in with grace mm. to understand what they, how they need to operate and how you can help provide them context on how you need to operate. Um, and then continuously reminding yourself that what got you there isn't necessarily going to continue to make yourself successful. And that, that probably that statement should probably be reflected on depending on how fast you're growing. Um, like every six months, even interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's Marshall Goldsmith. Is that, uh, what got you here? Won't get you there or yeah, that's a so, good yeah. book on that. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, that also just takes a lot of uh, self-awareness there too, and reflection time to do that. Uh, well, one of the things that you've told me about is that you've really found it important to establish outcomes, not outputs, um, outcomes, driven environments. Um, and you've also talked about slime mold to be a good <laughs> right. team operating model. Now I'm just like the ew factor on slime mold. I'm like, okay, so tell us what all that means. What is what is good about slime mold? First of all, <laughs> totally. Can we learn? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. When we talk about uh, outcomes versus outputs, um, I'll start mm -hmm. by saying it's absolutely not binary. It's like okay. it's a spectrum where you, like, there's a give and take between uh, leveraging outputs and then bouncing between like uh, I'd like to see this get done versus I'm looking to get this value. And if you stay too hard on one or the other, you're either stuck in this abstract of trying to understand like the objective of increasing this value or you're too focused on one specific thing and in, in marching towards it, even if it's not necessarily the best thing for the business. Um, so like always keep these, as, as I talk through the, like the, that, those two concepts, keep in mind that it's like nothing, like uh, it, the, being on the absolute of either is not the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there is a, uh, a, a good article written by Alex, and I'm going to butcher his last name. I think it's uh, Kamarask, from, uh, who's the head of corporate strategy over at Stripe. And he uses this analogy of making organizations operate more like slime molds, as you were saying, than, than maybe a military. And many successful organizations pride themselves on how quickly they can tackle problems, uh, especially early on, right? So it's very easy and uh, not very easy, nothing's easy, but like you can, you, you can essentially have this organic ability early on in a smaller organization uh, to provide context and support, even though it may feel like, like you might even consider that you think you're just literally telling for an output. But along the way, um, you, you're actually allowing them because it's a smaller org to uh, provide you more context. And so you, you, you are enabling them to explore the reasons why you're building it that, that actually unpack that outcome for you. And so when you're saying, I want to build this thing, uh, this new feature, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a, a modal with a button where they enter these fields. And then because you're in a, such a small group, you can ask like, well, why is it this field? I think I can build this in half the time. Mm -hmm. And then that may expose like, oh yeah, that's fine. Because what I'm really trying to do is get people to get from step one to step two. Right. So the nature of that field that I drew is actually less important than enabling them to get through it. So yes, yeah. make that trade off. But then as you get larger, all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, these high fidelity design documents that are managed by product managers. And those product managers are then working with you to then give those to engineers. And you've got five engineers working on that document and then they're executing within that field. And it's so hard now to work your way all the way back up and get that context. So you can no longer use just those lines of communication to provide that context. And at that point, you need to um, uh, provide additional pieces of collateral that uh, are passed along the way uh, that allow you to lend more and more of your justification so that that game of telephone is de-risked as much as possible. Right. So if we go back to slime molds, mm -hmm. a sli like you can imagine a Petri dish, right? And there's a slime mold and it's looking to get to some outcome, some, some source of food on the other side. 
there are obstacles throughout that mold that are in the way of the slime. Um, and it can find it for itself and it will find dead ends and turn around and that it will, it will have this branch structure that eventually gets to that outcome, but it's not the way that it might necessarily, uh, the optimal way is not directly to it. Right. Where okay. it, like, like that's where like, and you know, uh, I, 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 I want to be careful when I say like military, but if you, if you just like use that as an over-exaggerated direction and ignore those mountains and ignore those trees, mm -hmm. it's going to take them longer because they, 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 they have your context to get to there, but they don't have the empowerment necessarily to skip those mountains and work around it and, and, and find the optimal path in the most efficient time possible to get to that outcome. And that's where that, that, that concept of slime molds come in. You provide them an outcome, a target to achieve, give them the freedom to find the most efficient way there, mm -hmm. and then allow them to fail along the way when their hypothesized approach is not actually reaping benefits. Ah, I was just about to ask you, and you just told it, summed it all up on how you do that. So there's a lot of empowerment there uh, for your teams to make decisions on on how to do it rather than just like, here's here's what you need to do. You're like, okay, figure that out and some creativity. And I, I love the way you also added in uh, the freedom to make mistakes too, right? Uh, yeah, and be supportive totally. for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, another thing that you've talked to me about are feedback loops. Now, I, I think of feedback loops in engineering, meaning something perhaps a little bit different than in people, but uh, the same concept. So, you know, it, how do you incorporate feedback loops in these different contexts and what does it mean to you? Yeah, I think I get in trouble with people because of how much I focus on feedback loops sometimes. I'll mm -hmm. go out of my engineering environment. And I'll be like, oh, I'd like to give you some feedback on what we just talked about. And it's like, well, no, 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 we haven't built the trust in systems yet mm -hmm. to allow that process. So, okay, feedback loops. Um, I find it best on this one to discuss the topic with like some specifics. So if we go from small to big and I give, I'll give you a couple of like tactics along the way. So how can we give feedback loops uh, you know, engagements that are uh, within a given day or within a given meeting. Um, one thing, and I think this was another one I got to give another shout out to my CEO, Tammy, um, is stop the meeting a couple minutes early and literally rate the meeting on a scale of one to five. Go around the room and uh, how was the meeting? And that's it. You don't even have to give any more qualitative because by somebody rating the meeting, it will naturally expose how we could have optimized it more effectively. So that it's a really easy way that like all of a sudden lowers everybody's guard on, on creating feedback for literally the meeting that you just had. Right. right. Um, and the same can be said for pair programming. So if you're in a, an environment that promotes pair programming, um, do a mini retro and end five minutes early, what went well, what didn't go well, what's something that you like, uh, you want to encourage that you experience with your, your, the person you're pairing with, and maybe try to think of some sort of critical feedback. And it allows you to then have, once again, an environment where there's welcoming of feedback so that it doesn't feel like you really have to go out of your way to um, be constructive, which then creates a higher area, a, a higher wall, a higher barrier to right. how much it takes to then give that feedback. And mm -hmm. really what you're looking for um, is you want to give little F feedback, not big F feedback. And these are all processes to make sure that you get to talk about it when it's smoke and not fire. Okay. So that's, that's, that's one flow. So if we go a little bigger, then you've got stuff that teams tend to be a little bit better at, like formal retros and at some recurring cadence. Um, or maybe it's, so you, you probably have product teams. A lot of teams have cross-functional product teams, or you have your engineers, your engineering manager, your product manager, maybe a designer. And those teams, I'd say once a week, every once every two weeks, they should take time to, you know, write some cards, what went well, what didn't go well. You know, there's lots of different formats, start, stop, continue, like, lack, learn, long for, um, write out how you feel like that cadence of, or that segment of time is gone and then vote on the ones that, uh, you feel are the most relevant to discuss. You can do the same exact format for, uh, major release iterations then you can start to pull in stakeholders that aren't necessarily part of your direct team. Um, and there's also opportunities at our size now, now that we have you know, a little over 300 employees, we actually do some larger like product leadership cross-functional monthly retros, same format. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's just a different set of people to provide more feedback on. Once again, scaling causes growing pains. 
and we are we, we you are constantly outgrowing the processes that you had from six months ago. So that creates a forum that allows you to discuss that and decide where the team needs to invest more than their quote unquote day job of keeping the trains running. Um, yeah. I really like the way you describe it. It's not just, it's important to get feedback, but finding ways to, like you said, lower the barriers so that people feel comfortable giving feedback. And it doesn't have to be like something major, just little things to get it going early so that you aren't like letting it simmer <laughs> until it gets to the boiling point. And Absolutely. I, I, I love the way too, you said you, people can vote on what to talk about, like what seems important, like you're really building alignment by doing that as well uh, among the teams and um, getting inputs from others, uh, from everyone in the in the room on you know what kind of feedback would be important to discuss. Um, well, thank you. I if people want to get in touch with you, Pat, because I'm sure they're going to have questions or maybe even learn up about opportunities at Carrot. Um, can you give us uh, some examples of how people can get in touch with you? I will put it on the website for the podcast so people don't have to write it down, but just tell us what, how would you like to be contacted? Yeah, definitely. I think if it's, if it's simple enough and the lowest barrier, LinkedIn is definitely the best way. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I, I, I respond within a day uh, and, I, and I promise I will respond to any message I get. Uh, beyond that, if, if, if asked, uh, I have a coffee chat Calendly for 30 minutes connected with a Zoom call that I'm more nice. than happy to give to anyone that would like to chat because um, a lot of the things I've learned along the way, I, 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 it, it's tough to build that network as you're, you're, you're earlier on and looking for people to talk to about these things um, is, is definitely something that brings me joy. So I'm more than happy to lend 30 minutes of my time to explore these topics uh, further with anyone. Wow, that is altruistic too, as a part of the mission there over at Carrot and just yourself aligned with that and uh, understanding how important it is to build your network and, and learn. Well, thank you for sharing, first of all, everything that you've, you've shared on this podcast and then also opportunities for people to talk to you further about it. Uh, this has been very enlightening. Uh, learning about the different ways that you deal with growth of yourself as a leader, as well as company growth and teams and, and empowering people. It sounds like a really big theme that you've mentioned of, of empowering people along the way to be involved in the decision-making um, and development of, of products to, to make them the best that they can possibly be. So uh, we're going to wrap up. We're like at time here, but thank you so much, Pat, for being a guest on Reinventing Nerds. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate the thought you uh, put into these questions and how it helped guide the conversation. This was a lot of fun. Oh, good. Well, thank you. And thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We're at reinventingnerds.com and we will see you next time.